So in this clip, actually from Captain America Civil War, Peter Parker, Spider-Boy, meets his fellow superhero, Tony Stark, who is Iron Man. And when he's confronted with this video evidence, Peter confesses that he has been transformed into Spider-Man. And as they talk, Peter admits that he wants to use the gifts that he has been given to make a difference in a world. He wants to use his gifts for good. And although none of us are superheroes that I know of, each of us has had to wrestle with a similar issue to what Peter is facing. How to use the gifts and abilities we have. Now, if you're a superhero or a supervillain, uh, the distinction there often comes down to how you use your gifts, right? After the lightning strikes, after you've been blasted with gamma rays, after you've been bitten by a spider, you have to make a choice how to use your gifts, to use them for good or to use them for evil. And on some level, the same is true for those of us who follow Jesus, now, we don't suddenly gain the ability to climb walls when we follow Jesus, but there is something that happens to us. There is change that occurs. And the key is for us, like Peter, to use that transformation as an opportunity for good. To use the gifts that we've been given for good in the world. And this is the kind of transformation that we're talking about in our current series here at Rooftop, which is called Morph, which is all about Romans 12 and what the Apostle Paul says. Now, you'll remember Paul was an early follower of Jesus. He shared the good news of who Jesus was and what he had done throughout the Roman Empire, preaching and writing letters, including his letter to the Romans that we have been walking through here at Rooftop. And last week, Donnie introduced this series, and he talked about Romans 12, 1 and 2, where Paul calls us to be transformed, to be changed, to be morphed. And Donnie also mentioned that Romans 12 marks something of a shift in tone from what we've been talking about in the rest of Romans, because Romans chapters 1 through 11 are really about how things are. But Romans 12 and following are really about the way things should be. They're about ethics, the way that people who follow Jesus should live. And so, the, so this morning and for the next several weeks, we're going to be digging in to what the morphed lives of those who follow Jesus should look like. Now, if you don't follow Jesus and you're here this morning, I'm glad you're here. But I want to speak to you very specifically for a moment. Because as Paul writes Romans 12, he's writing to a group of people who have already decided what they think about Jesus. And so even though over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about a lot of really interesting and practical information, I want to challenge each of you. Make sure you know what you think about who Jesus is before you really consider the question of how to live that Paul is digging into here. Now, I want everyone to hear very clearly Paul's main message from Romans 12, 3 through 8, which is our passage for this morning. Because in this passage, Paul says that transformation in Christ affects all of who we are. Belonging to Jesus impacts our bodies our minds, our spirits, our souls. It affects all of us. Paul's point here is that belonging to Jesus is totally transformative. In the same way that Peter Parker is completely transformed into Spider-Man, so those who belong to Jesus are totally changed. So let's take a look at Romans 12, 3 through 8, and then we'll dig in to what it says. So Paul writes, 
For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. And so in these verses, Paul is revealing that transformation in Christ affects the totality of who we are. How and what we believe impacts how we think, how we relate to other people, the things that we value, and how we act. The point that Paul's making here is that the good news of Jesus, that Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again, should impact all of us. It should reach down to the core of who we are. There is no part of our lives that Jesus should not transform. And so for the rest of our time this morning, we're going to walk through Romans 12, 3 through 8, examining what Paul has to say about the totality of this transformation and how it should affect how we think and how we act. So look again at verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul's message here is that transformation leads to right thinking. Thinking of ourselves accurately, thinking of ourselves soberly, as both sinners and saints. In the first part of this verse, Paul warns us, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Don't think of yourself as better than you actually are. Don't forget you've messed up this week. How many of you have messed up this week? All right, a little over half of you. That's better than first service. <laughs> Those of you who raised your hands, you're sinners. Congratulations. The rest of you, you can tune out. There's nothing else in this message for you. <clears throat> Don't forget that you have messed up. That is what Paul's saying. Don't think of yourself as perfect. But then he continues, think of yourself with sober judgment, right? Think of yourself accurately. Think of yourself like someone who isn't drunk would think of themselves. Right? And that means not thinking too highly of yourself. But it also means not thinking too lowly of yourself either. Paul's point is that we need to think according to the measure of faith that God has assigned us. That is, we need to think of ourselves like God thinks of us. Avoiding both arrogance and despair when it comes to how we think about us. Now, there's actually some really fascinating psychology around all of this. And basically, it boils down to this. We constantly lie to ourselves. When it comes to us, unchecked, we lie to ourselves about who we are. Some of us think more highly of ourselves than we ought. This is called illusory superiority. I'm much better than Jeremy. <laughs> much better than Jeremy, right? Or we think of ourselves too lowly, and this is called the worse-than-average effect, right? Oh, I'm not even as good as an average person. And so the truth is, there are some of you here today who are actually much better people than you think you are. And there are others of you who think of yourselves as way more impressive than you actually are. And the question is, which kind of person 
are you? One of my favorite things to do is to watch fail videos online where people screw things up. And I grabbed a couple off the internet for you. Take a look. Oh, oh, no. How else are you going to flip? <laughs> okay, all right, whatever. Nailed it. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, <laughs> apart from my probably like sinful reaction to watching all of these things happen, um, I love watching stupid people play stupid games and winning stupid prizes. Uh, one of the best things about these videos is just the brash arrogance of the people doing these things. Right? I can make that jump. I can do that flip. I can pull that off until, no. Reality smacks you in the face. Sober thinking keeps us from being the focus of a fail video. And, but sober thinking also requires that we think rightly about the things we can do. Even though other people have failed, other, even though I have messed up in the past, sober thinking says that there's no excuse for looking down on the things that I can do and the talents that I do have. One of my friends in high school was a fantastic singer. She was really good, but she didn't believe that about herself. And so when American Idol came to town, she didn't go audition because she was afraid she was going to be one of those people who shows up to the audition thinking they can sing and just not being able to carry a tune in a bucket. My friend needed to think soberly about who she was. So what about us? How do we think soberly about ourselves? I have two suggestions. First, we need to recognize that we're simultaneously sinners and saints. Other than those of you who didn't just raise your hands a few moments ago, everyone in here is a sinner. You've all messed up, this week in fact. But because of what Jesus has done on the cross, those who belong to him are also saints. They are more than the sum of their mistakes. Sober thinking means taking this reality into account. It means remembering who you are, and more importantly, who God has made you to be. And then living in the light of that reality. And then the second thing we can do is we can actually listen to the people in our lives who we trust and who give us feedback about who we are. A couple weeks ago, I was having breakfast with a friend, uh, and he just said to me, he said, Jacob, I'm seeing this thing in your life, I'm seeing this way you're thinking, I'm seeing this way you're acting, and I don't, I don't know if you're aware of that, and I don't know if that's who you want to be. And I was, I was a little taken aback. I didn't expect to hear this about myself. But after really thinking and praying about it, I came to the realization that, yeah, my friend was right. Now, sober thinking doesn't mean just taking whatever criticism that someone offers of you and making that absolutely true. But it does mean hearing a message and taking its words to heart. Sober thinking means taking those opportunities when you could be offended by what someone says and instead going, you know what? You're right. That is who I am. And by God's grace, I'm going to work on that. And I actually think this is one of the major benefits of being part of the Capital C Church. This opportunity that we all have to develop close relationships with people for the sake of growth. And I think this is what Paul is saying in verses 4 and 5 of Romans 12. He writes, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, 
So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And these verses actually parallel what Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians, where he says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And the point here is that transformation in Christ, when you get those gifts and you get those abilities, it's not just for you. When you have been transformed, it's not just for your good, it's for the good of those around you as well. Because when you recognize you have gifts and they are good, and you recognize that they're for others, you actually act differently. And this is something I think Rooftop does a pretty good job with, to be honest. In my few months here, I have seen a lot of Rooftoppers using their time and their energy and their talents to help those in our church and in our community. When someone is facing a rough situation and they ask for prayer, Rooftop prays. When someone in a small group needs help with something, they need to move or they're going through a rough time, Rooftop's small groups show up. When the food pantry or the homeless ministry needs supplies, you guys fill those bins in the entryway to overflowing. When someone is diagnosed with cancer and they don't think about eating amidst all the chaos going on in their lives, Rooftop shows up with food. When Pastor Matt and Michelle have all sorts of things going on in their life because of what's happening to Mitchell, Rooftop shows up to scrape paint. And so I want to applaud all of you for being part of a church community that uses your gifts and your transformation for good. But I also want to encourage you to continue using those gifts for good. Because right thinking, sober thinking, takes a lot of hard, ongoing work. And in fact, right thinking isn't actually enough. Remember Paul's big point here. Transformation in Jesus affects all of who we are. It's not enough to just think the right thing or even to want to do the right thing. We actually have to do the right thing. It's not enough for someone to join Alcoholics Anonymous and want to become sober or think that they should become sober. They actually have to do the hard work of not drinking alcohol. And that's what Paul is talking about in verses 6 through 8 here. He says, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And the point here is that transformation in Christ leads to right action. Actually doing the things that God has given us the gifts to do. It wasn't enough for Peter Parker to simply have the ability to be Spider-Man. He actually had to get up, put on his suit, climb out his window, and go do something. And that is what Paul is saying here, too. We have gifts. Gifts that differ according to the grace given us by God. Whatever talents and abilities we have, Paul reminds us, they're not ultimately ours. They've come first from God, and we have to start there when thinking about whatever it is that we're doing. And then Paul lists seven particular gifts here. Now, these gifts are typically understood as spiritual gifts because they're gifts from God that are given to people in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. So they're spiritual gifts. And most people recognize that these, aren't, these seven gifts are not all of the gifts that God gives us. This is just kind of a cross-section of some gifts that people have. 
And if you've been in the church for any length of time, you know that spiritual gifts can be a contentious issue, especially when it comes to gifts like the first one Paul mentions, prophecy. And basically the issue there boils down to this. Different Christians believe that gifts like prophecy mean different things. There are some Christians who think that prophecy means foretelling the future. It's a miraculous gift. It's a sign gift. Uh, it's, it's something very special. And then there are other Christians who believe that prophecy just means, kind of in a general sense, proclaiming the truth. It's still a spiritual gift. It's still from God, but it's a little less miraculous. And there are a ton of theological weeds on both of these uh, views, and we're not going to get into those this morning. But what I will say is that you are welcome at Rooftop whether you believe prophecy is foretelling the future or you think prophecy is the proclamation of truth or you walked in here this morning and you weren't really thinking about prophecy and so you have no idea what it means. All of those views are okay here. And the, reason that it, and the reason that's the case is because here at Rooftop, we focus on Paul's larger message. His message that whatever gifts or abilities you have, you need to use them. Verse 6, let us use them. If God has given you a gift, you have to put it into practice. Some of you have incredible servant's hearts. You love helping people. If that's who you are, you need to serve. Some of you are extremely excited and bubbly in the morning before you've had your coffee. It's a little annoying to the rest of us. If that's you, perhaps you have the gift of encouragement. If you have the gift of encouragement, encourage people. Some of you are good teachers. Some of you are natural leaders. People will follow you in the battle. Some of you are really empathetic. You understand where other people are coming from. You have the gift of mercy. If you have these gifts, use them. Most of the people in this room have been blessed with material prosperity beyond what the vast majority of the world can even imagine. God has blessed you. And if God has blessed you, maybe he has given you the gift of generosity. And if you have the, Paul, the gift of generosity, Paul says you need to use it. You need to give. Some of you are artists or writers or you're good with handling money. You love working with kids. You're good at doing things with your hands. You're really good at playing a musical instrument or worshiping. Whatever gifts you've been given, God wants you to use them. Now, learning to use your gifts is often a big part of God's transforming work. When I was younger, I was absolutely terrified of speaking in front of people. I was so scared of people looking at me that when I was late to church or school, I would hide out in the hallway so that no one could turn around and look at me when I walked in. And as God got a hold of my life and began kind of revealing uh, the gifts that I had, he revealed that maybe I had the gift of teaching, which requires that you stand in front of a large group of people while they look at you. Now, God didn't just give me the gift and then flip a switch so that I wasn't afraid of, doing, of being in front of people anymore. But he did give me experiences and opportunities to grow, to walk the process of growth, to continually be transformed. And that's obviously still a path that I am on. And it was a path and a process of transformation, learning how to use the gifts I'd been given. 
And so some of you may be sitting here thinking, well, what about me? What about my gifts? How do I use the gifts that God has given me? Well, I'm glad you asked. First, you need to discover the gift that you've been given. And there are a lot of ways to do this. Many of you are familiar with personality tests, things like the Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram or Strengths Finders. Maybe you've taken a spiritual gifts inventory of some sort in your life. Those are all really good ways to start the process of discovering what gifts you have to help you better understand who you are. Another way to discover is through experience. Man, I, I think I might be good working with kids. Well, go try that out. I am forever indebted to a pastor in southwest Michigan who saw something in me that probably no one else said and gave me an opportunity to start leading in the church. First, we have to discover what our gifts are. And then we have to find a place to apply them. Now, some of you have gifts that fit really well in the church. You're, you have gifts that are perfect for serving in the church. And others of you have gifts that fit better in other environments. The key is to use whatever gift you have wherever God has given you the opportunity to use it. I have a friend. He works a job that doesn't let him get to church very often, but he still uses the gifts that God has given him in his home, in his place of work, and throughout the week as he's able in the community. Even if you are not in a place right now where you can do a lot at church, God has still given you gifts to serve in the world. And the key is you just have to do it. We can't just think about our gifts. We can't just learn about our gifts. We can't just want to do this. We actually have to get out there and do the hard work of using the gifts that God has given us. That's what Paul is saying here in Romans 12. He wants us to get out there, think rightly about ourselves, and get to work using the gifts that we've been given. Now, I'm a tangible person. If I don't write something down, or put it on a calendar, or hang it on my wall, I, it's gone. Within a day, it's gone. It's gone forever. And so to tangibilify our need to wrestle with this message, on the way out of service this morning, the greeting team is going to hand you a piece of paper. And it's going to look like this. And across the top is this big question. Where can I use my gifts. And on the rest of the piece of paper is a list of the serving teams we have here at Rooftop. Serving teams both in the church and in the community. And you don't necessarily need to use your gift on one of those serving teams. But I do want to challenge you to use this piece of paper as a tangible reminder this week of your need to wrestle with the question, where can I use my gifts? Where can I do the good that God has called me to? Several weeks ago, I said that faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. And in Romans 12, Paul is making that really, really practical for us. He's reminding us that we have been transformed in Christ. And that when we've been transformed in Christ, God has given us work to do and the gifts to do it with. Let's pray. <clears throat>